Okay, today's class is on first agriculture, the origin of agriculture. And uh, to get ready for this lecture, I want, I want everyone to think, to think way back, way back in history, back to the beginning, way back to last Friday. All right? So what, what group of people did you uh, all learn about last Friday? The Kung. The Kung. Very good. And what type of lifestyle did the Kung lead? lead? I already got you. Come on, what did the Kung do for a living? Hunting and gathering. Very good. They're hunters and gatherers. So before we link up with the origin of agriculture, I wanted to go over something from last class. Okay, do you remember this diagram here? Who can explain this? Briefly, what this was about. As the, it compares the like energy cost of their efforts versus the round trip and distance, as it says, and as they eat their way outwards from their center point at their base camp, their energy increases as they have to travel further distance, and then the in, the sharp rise in the graph represents overnight trips and really long distances that they have to travel. Right, so what, what kind of food do they come gather generally? What's their favorite food? Nuts. Mangongo nuts. Mangongo nuts, right. So as, as the kung go outward, it costs them more energy. So if I have to travel a longer distance to get my mangongo nuts as I use the ones near my camp, there's a greater energy cost. And then right here, as she pointed out, this is the overnight trip, so there's a big jump. You have to do an overnight trip, trip, go a long ways, carry a lot of food with you, and then it levels out again. Okay, how, okay, how, who remembers this? What does this mean? E-R-O-I can't see it. Yeah. Energy return on investment. Perfect. Energy return on investment. What does this have to do with energy return on investment? Yeah. Doesn't that mean that, that you should be receiving more energy than, uh, you should get more input than output basically. You should get more than it took for you to obtain that. So you get more output, you get more back than you put in, right? right. Well generally, yeah. What's, what's the... If, if we say energy return on investment is a ratio between what you get out against what you put in, what is the lowest EROI that a Kung would like to have? One to one. One to one. Why is that? Same amount they get. Yeah. What happens if they get less than that? What's that? I, I heard it. Yeah. I'm going to be like... Yeah, you get wacky. hungry. You know, it keeps going. You starve over time. Okay, so I want you to take your knowledge of EROI, knowledge of anthropology here, your knowledge of uh, basic math, and I want you to get somebody next to you, and I want you to show me what the EROI graph would look like over the round trip distance. And I'll give you about uh, two minutes to do it. So I want, instead of cost, I want EROI. So grab somebody next to you and write down what the graph would look like. Okay, who, who's feeling brave enough to do this? I've got the beginning to the graph up here. Who wants to do it? You want to do it? What's your name? Bill. Bill. Come on, Bill. Bill the Brain. Yeah, draw a line. How many people think he's right? Well, I agree with you. This is, this is pretty good. So it's, it's pretty much the inverse of this. Why, what is their output generally? 
What could you say about their output, knowing the Kung, because they're hunters and gatherers, what do you know about their output? Basically, they use every part of the animal they use to hide. Yeah, that's true. I think what I'm trying to lead you to, and not very successfully, is that they, they can only, they can only uh, gather what they can carry. They might have a few containers, their hands, what they eat, so their output is fairly fixed. So we can make an easy ratio with it. If the output is pretty constant, then there's just this change, so it's the input. So for the Kung, it's not a bad energy return on investment generally, unless it's during times of starvation. So just keep that in mind when we look at agriculture. Okay. It's well, often yeah. 10 to 1, Rick. Hmm? 10 calories, they Lee calculated 10 calories back per calorie invested. Pretty good. Generally, That's why yeah, they have so good. much leisure, except for the drought times. Yep. So I said, not bad for hunters and gatherers in good times, 10 to 1. All right? Now, just a little review from last time. The human species. For most of the history of the human species, Homo sapiens, 200,000 years, they've been hunter-gatherers. And uh, thus, humans have developed you know, evolution, has uh, made an impact on them according to this lifestyle. Also, uh, culturally, if you look at the genus Homo, you're talking two million years. So it goes far back for the most, most of history Humans have been hunters and gatherers. And generally everyone was a hunter and gatherer. This was the thing to do. You know, it was like bell bottoms. <laughs> so what would you say about the number of hunters and gatherers today? Hardly any. Hardly any. Well, why is that? Well, there's a, there's a lot of reasons. We're going to get at that. Yeah, yeah, it's rhetorical. <laughs> so there, there's, there's very few today. So we want to look at some basic questions in today's lecture. First is, why is that? And this transition to hunters, from hunters and gatherers to agricultural societies, how did this occur? And since this is an environmental class, we want to say, what was the impact on the environment of this change? Hunters and gatherers have minimal impact on their environment. They have some. Everyone has some. And this transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture, I mean, what was the effect on the evolution of human culture? Because that's another main theme for this course. Who can give me a good idea about what agriculture is? When we're talking about agriculture, what does that mean to you? What do you think, Boris? It's like taking wild plants and um, have them um, cultivated in a closed system. Cultivating wild plants in a closed system? Okay, pretty good. Who wants to add anything to that? Is it always wild plants? Sometimes dom mostly domesticated. Probably started out with wild plants. Anything else? More energy per acre. More cal calories of energy per acre. That's very good. That, that, that shows the power of this system. You now we're looking at an engineered ecosystem. Where if you do agriculture, you get more of the energy, more of the sun's energy coming to humans. If you look at uh, the uh, lifestyle of a hunter and gatherer, you have all this sunlight coming down, and it's being picked up by trees, bushes. Most of the things that aren't edible to humans. They go to other parts of the ecosystem. There's only a small component of plants and animals that humans can, can uh, eat. So when humans take part in agriculture, they're taking all this energy and trying to move it to themselves. So if you look at a cornfield, a lot of the energy that's being gathered by the sun goes to people, or indirectly to people. So I heard, I heard 
that girl in the back talk about this, there's a big difference in production for humans. So you could say uh, on, an, on an acre of land or hectare of land in hunting and gathering, you got less than 1% that ends up um, going to humans. But in an agricultural land, under agricultural production, you get 90% 90 per, 90 sometimes. And here's just some, uh, some yields for corn per uh, unit hectare, just to see how great the amount of energy humans can divert to themselves. So as such, you could put 10 to 100 times more people on an area of land. It's a huge jump. And that has impacts later on when we look at, well, why is agriculture all, all over the world? So and then a high energy return on investment, usually, though they work harder, we know that from the studies, they get more back. There's a great energy surplus. So remember that. Even write that word down and start. Energy surplus. All right? Now here's a, a very interesting, um, some studies were done by the Tusik and others. I think I spelled it right. I see at the end. I see. We'll change it later. But 40 to 60 percent of the energy from photosynthesis on the planet goes to humans directly or indirectly today. That's amazing. That's unbelievable. And that just shows what a huge impact agriculture has on the environment. Okay, when we're, when we're going to talk about agriculture, we have to talk about domestication. Okay? So, who can, who can give me an idea of what domestication is all about? Well, it alters nitrogen and composition so that it has more um, characteristics desired by humans. Yeah, so we alter the genetic makeup in a way that benefits humans. All right, so we're looking at genetic engineering, and not the kind we're doing today, but a slower process, selective breeding. We're taking evolution and natural selection, and we're bending it to get what we want. All right? So, let's see, who thinks they know, that, you know, we do genetic engineering today in a nice big laboratory, I've done it before, cutting and splicing DNA, where do you think the first genetic engineering occurred? How did we, where did the first signs of domestication occur? Did they have labs back thousands of years ago like that? What do you think? It's kind of it's kind of a trick question. What do you think? Oh, they just took the best animals they had and put them together and hope they made it. Okay, partially, partially that happened. And even, even further back, what do you think? Uh, okay, Mesopotamia. That's the area where some of the first domestication occurred. So he's got the where. Let, let's get to if I have a village, where does it happen? Well, you got the right geographic area. You're way ahead of. You want to know? Fields of grass. <laughs> and the garbage dumps and the latrines. And you say, what? This was the ancient laboratories for domestication. So imagine I'm going out, I'm gathering food, I'm bringing it back. Who, who has picked blueberries here? Strawberries. Okay, when you go out, do you cheat a little and taste them a little bit? I always do. If you find a bitter plant, what do you generally do? You stay away from it. You go for the sweeter plants. Do you pick the small blueberries or the big ones? The big ones. So you bring these back, you bring these back, and ancient hunters and gatherers would bring these back, they eat them. 
You go over there to the latrine later, maybe dump some out that got crushed in the sun. But what they're doing is selecting for the best ones, for humans, the biggest ones, the sweetest ones, the ones that don't give you a stomach ache. And they bring these back, and they start growing in their garbage dumps and latrines, their kitchen mittens. This is the first beginnings of selection to get domesticated animals, ones, plants and animals, ones that are changed, altered, to benefit humans. And later on, it became more, uh, uh, there was more a conscious decision to do it. Okay, we'll take these, we'll take these uh, two big animals and breed them together and get more meat. But this was the early beginnings of it. Say, when it comes to plants, what was desired? What, what do humans want out of a plant? Because they're going to domesticate them. What do you want out of a plant? Yeah, taste. Taste. Very good. You want things to taste good. What else do you want? It has to be edible. It has to be edible. True. You don't want to harvest bark, and you don't want to harvest some kind of mushroom that's going to kill you. What else? High yields. High yield. Perfect. Anything else? <coughs> climate. climate. Climate can control what you get. Um, when the plant produces food. Yeah, you, you want something reliable, something like that. Oh, oh, and, and easy to gather, too. Some of the selection that went on with plants uh, had to do with the tools they were using to, to uh, harvest them. So if you went around and there were grains, these stalks of grains with the seeds on the head, they were using little hand tools to scrape them off. So you're selecting for plants that are easy to scrape right there as well. Because the ones you can't get, you don't bring their seeds back, right? And you don't use them to plant next year. So that's another way things were selected. So I put a little list here. Size, abundance. You want them to grow pretty fast. You don't want to have to wait. Like a, You don't want to domesticate oak trees. You know, you plant your oak tree and then come back in 20, 40 years and see if you, if you bred them correctly. <coughs> so here, here's, you know, it sounds like a slow process and it is of domestication, but it can have huge impacts. Here's an example. This is the ancient plant that corn came from. We're talking a thousands of years going on, this genetic engineering. But look at the difference. I mean, this is a much higher yield than going around and picking these, huh? So in looking at this and getting back to energy, this is a big energy. Uh, it's a way to use genetics to increase your energy surplus. And we'll talk about why that's important later. Well, you probably have some idea anyways. OK, let's go way back again to last week. And oops. what does Anna Karenina have to do with anything? What's that all about? Think back to diamond. What does that phrase have to do with anything? <coughs> Way back. Marriage. What's that? Marriage, like marriage between like a people and animals, like trying to get like the best animals, like to make the best relationship. Yeah, it has to do with marriage, and they use it as an analogy for domestication of animals. So, what was the quote from this that they use as an analogy for the? What animals you could domesticate? What was it about marriage? What did they say about marriage? You guys remember the quote? A ask them who Anna Karenina was first. Do they know that? You know that? It was a book by Leo Tolstoy. And the quote more or less is that happy families are uh, all happy in the same way, and unhappy families are unhappy in their own Right, brilliant. Tolstoy. There's a quote in it saying that all happy families are happy in the same way. 
And what does that mean? You know, there has to be understanding, attraction, uh, the way they deal with kids. All these things have to be right for a successful marriage to happen, right? But if you look at marriages that have failed or families that are having trouble, they're all unique in, in their problems. If you take one of those things away, you can have a big problem. If you're not attracted to each other, if you can't talk to each other, if you can't deal with your children the same way. And they use this analogy when it comes to domestication of animals. So here's an example from the book. It seems like it would make sense for Africans to domesticate the zebra. Wouldn't it be useful? It'd be just like for the Europeans having a horse. Well, why didn't why didn't this happen in this case? Who knows? Yeah. Because zebras wouldn't breed in like a closed area. Wasn't it like difficult for them? They have difficulty to breed, and what's an even more thing that jumps out at you right away? The duck. The duck. That's another thing. Yeah. Aggressive. Aggressive. What what do they say they do? They bite me. Oh my god. Yeah, they bite you and they don't let go. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that's an unhappy marriage right there between animals and humans. So using this analogy, Diamond goes and he, and he looks and says, why are all the domesticated animal, man, animals, or most of them, coming from Europe? And he looks at the animals around the world, and in some cases, there weren't many of them, big mammals. Think of uh, Australia. There's, you know, kangaroo, that's it. So what, what, what are the problems with places like Africa? Why weren't there more domesticated animals coming from there? What do you need to domesticate an animal? What traits? One is not mean, right? What else? Certain kinds of food, what kind of food are those? Plants, why? <coughs> energy, what about energy? It's like one of the lowest in the pyramid. Yeah, lowest in the pyramid, very energy efficient. It's hard living off of lions because you know you need gazelles to feed the lions, you need grass. And you could probably make a longer one. Social structure. So they have to be used to living in groups, and what else? What helps? What's very beneficial? <coughs> when you think of dogs versus cats. They have to, the animal has to be submissive to humans, right? Yeah, submissive to humans. I mean, you have to be able to, in most cases, punk an animal, you know? They have to know who's the boss. It's surprisingly it's surprising that we ever domesticated cats. I mean, you can't you can't bully a cat. <laughs> you can bully a dog though. You're not a cat. Kit, you're not my boss, you know. <laughs> okay, what other things? So we got what else? To be able to follow a leader. Follow a leader, yep. What else? Anything else? Yep. You have to be able to breed in captivity. Breed in captivity. Who couldn't Give me an example of something that has trouble breeding in captivity. Cheetahs. Cheetahs. They have to go on like a 75-mile flirt. <laughs> so it's really hard for them in a cage. Anything else? Yeah. Growth rate. A growth rate? Like you can't, growth rate. You can't yeah. breed an elephant because it's going to take like 15 years to grow. Perfect. Elephants take a long time to grow. You'd have to wait a long time to eat them. Okay, uh, let's see. There's one more. Who knows it? How about why don't we get antelope and gazelle in cages? They freak out. Yeah. <laughs> they jump all around. They hurt themselves. It's too much of a pain. Okay. As some of you guys are writing this down, and I know somebody knew the answer to this because they already told me. Where did we find the first agriculture? And where did it occur? occur on the earth. Yeah. Fertile Crescent in the Middle East. Fertile Crescent in the Middle East. Very good. Where are some other early places? Yeah. Egypt next to the mountain. Yeah, in Egypt. Um, that might, that probably wasn't an original place. It probably spread from the Fertile Crescent, but agriculture was there at very early times. How about some original places? Mexico. Mexico, yeah. Much later, but it started there on its own, yeah? Asia. Asia, China, Yellow River. Are the Andes. Some in the Andes, yeah. 
So there's some in the early areas. So Central Africa, original places where it sprouted up from and wasn't spreading. South America, the Americas, China. Some in the South Pacific, uh, Southern Pacific areas here, New Guinea and that, those places. It's in your book too. And strangely enough, a lot of the early domestication of animals happened in similar areas. So Mesopotamia, Little <coughs> Crescent, Donkey over in, uh, in uh, Ethiopia. I used to live right around here. And there were donkeys everywhere. We used to call them Adgi. Pigs out in Asia. A smaller number in the Americas, but there were still some domestication of animals. Mostly smaller ones. Now, who can tell me where the Fertile Crescent is? Where is it? You know? Between Tigris and Euphrates. Yeah, between Tigris and Euphrates. So, in here. So, I know where they, those are. Some of Syria, some of Jordan, Israel, Lebanon. So, this is where some of the earliest agriculture started. So remember, fertile crescent, fertile crescent, that's important. So why did it develop in the fertile crescent and not some other place? What was important about the fertile crescent? Yeah? Had rich soil. They had pretty good soil. They have the richest soil? And the soil was suitable for plant growth. Yeah, it was suitable for plants. But it wasn't the richest place, and that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, you get richer soils in Argentina, but agriculture didn't start in Ar Argentina. It started in the Fertile Crescent. When we think about, you know, getting lots of food and corn, we don't think generally of Iraq or Syria. That's where it started, yeah. Water easily accessible in most cases. There's some dry areas there. What other reasons? Why do you think it even? Why do you think they even started moving from agriculture on, to agriculture from hunting and gathering? Yeah. yeah. The, the plants that were growing there were easy to domesticate. Yeah. Why is that? He says the plants there were easy to domesticate. Why would that be the case? Grasses. Grasses? What? What about? Them? What kind of climate do you have here? Mediterranean climate, what is that about? What is the Mediterranean climate? When's it wet? <laughs> when is the wet season? You get you get you get winter rains. Fairly dry summers. And this tends to uh, increase the predominance of annuals, like grains. And this is important. So there are a lot of different kinds of grains here. Now how about if I said that, that there was big difference in differences in elevation, that this had a factor on it, on the number of plants there, why, why would this be? I'm saying that had something to do with it, that there were mountains and valleys. Why would this impact on the amount of plants available, different amounts of plants available? Yeah? Oh, well, different elevations have different temperatures and regions. Like yeah. As you go up in elevation, it gets colder. Right. Um, so you have different habitats. You have colder habitats, wetter habitats. Remember the rain shadow? You got something else to add? Well, yeah, isn't it also the elevation was that uh, the people would actually go up in elevation during the warmer season and go down elevation in the colder season? In some cases, yes. So then they would grow different plants. Mm -hmm. You could grow different plants at different times. So because of different climates, there's all different climates, there's more plants more available plants. And also, if you started agriculture, you could do it on different uh, temperature levels. So you, yeah. could, you could plant some crops um, in cooler climates during one point, part of the season and then at other elevations during other parts of the season. Yeah. How, what do you know about where the Fertile Crescent is when you look at big geography? Where is it? What's it part of? What landmass? 
Yeah. yeah. Middle East, and what's it connected to? A little bit of Africa, but it's it's kind of part of that big uh, Eurasia landmass. Diamond often combines Europe and Asia into one landmass because they're pretty much connected. What do you know about this landmass compared to the other ones? Yeah. Its axis is horizontal. Not yep. Axis is horizontal, not vertical. And what does this have an impact when we're thinking about plants and animals? Yeah. The movement of uh, plants along the line because of their ability to grow. Yeah. The climates are fairly similar along these axes, so the plants and animals can move around. So if we look at the Middle East here. There's a big diversity of animals because animals from here and plants from here usually can move into that area. Animals. And also, when you domesticate something here, generally you can move it over here. So this became a big agricultural center because of that. So geology. And this gets back to Yali's <laughs> question. Why does this area have so much stuff? Well, this is one of the reasons. Also, the original food sources were becoming scarce. In that area, they mostly hunted gazelles, and these were decreasing. So it was making it a little tougher for hunters and gatherers uh, to survive. Somewhat fertile land, like Horace said. Mediterranean climate. More grains. Barley and wheat. Mountainous. Many habitats. And another thing that helped agriculture take off in the Fertile Crescent was you had a broad mix of foods. So you could get a balanced diet. You had pulses there. You had agri uh, grains there. You had domesticated animals there. In other areas of the globe, they were able to domesticate, you know, maybe one of these, maybe a grain, maybe a pulse. But it wasn't a balanced enough diet to get people to give up hunting and gathering and go and do agriculture. Yeah. Better tell them what a pulse is. Pulse. Pulse, like peas and beans, high in protein, uh, make their own nitrogen. And again, Many animals with the right traits in the area. And these could be used for fertilizer, work, milk, clothing. So we had a total package in, the, in that area. And everything they needed to start. <laughs> Here's some just some early Domesticated plants, got the pea, got wheat. These were some of the first. Okay. Now, let's get to some of the biggie questions. What was the effect of agriculture on human culture? I mean, I, I started off and said, you get a high energy return on investment. You get a big surplus of energy. What's one of the first things that happens when you get this big increase on your, uh, in your surplus energy? I heard it here. What do you say? Population growth. Population growth. Yep. You get higher population growth. Well, that's, that's the first thing. You get greater, since you can have greater food per area, you get greater population per area. Why would the population increase like that? Yeah? If you have food to feed it, substantial so on people, population will grow. If you don't have enough food, you can feed the population. Yeah, in some ways, we, you know, we're increasing uh, the carrying capacity when we, when we engineer the land. 
we have more food, we can get more people through the lean times. What else? Um, if you're growing food, then you have to stay where you are. Mm -hmm. That way you can have more kids because you're not carrying them with you. Yeah, that's a big thing. You can uh, move into more sedentary lifestyle. You've got to stay with your crops generally and, and look after them so you're not traveling all the time. What do hunters and gatherers do when it comes to reproduction? Yeah. Um, they have kids, I think it's said like every five years, um, so the kid can grow and then they can another kid because they do have to carry yeah, four to five years because they don't want three kids who are under four to carry. Kids can walk around. So the birth spacing decreases. Agriculturalists can do two years, one year. So because they're sedentary. And also, if they're sedentary, they can work on storage and then get even more people. So with sedentary lifestyle, You can start developing towns and cities because you can have more people per unit area. So I, I found on the internet a couple couple pictures of some uh, ancient towns. You guys ready? I don't want to switch these two quick. Here's one from southern Turkey, ancient city. It's a uh, 6,500 years old. So you're able to have a lifestyle that's sedentary, more people, and it has other impacts we'll go into. Because what do you need for a city? Yeah? Government? Yeah, you need government. You need specialists. Not everyone's planning. And we'll get into that. So again, we got that sedentary lifestyle, shorter birth spacing. <coughs> We're reducing um, the amount of famines that take place because you got that surplus. And what does that have to do with carrying capacity? Remember carrying capacity? What is agriculture doing? Yeah, you're, you're artificially increasing the carrying capacity of the area you live in because you're engineering it. Okay, let's get back to this idea of a town. We said you need leaders in a town. What else do you need? If you have a surplus, what can you do with it? You can store it. What else? You have to manage it. You got to manage it. You need managers. What else? Yeah. Sell it. Sell it. Yeah. You need trade. What else do you need? What can what can does everyone have to be a farmer in a big town? No. No. What else do we get? Religious leaders, what else? Uh, tool, makers. tool makers, craftsmen, craftswomen, what else? Army. Armies. Okay, now we're starting to we're starting to think a little bit. And one of the original questions was, well, why did agriculture spread? Because we heard hunting and gathering wasn't so bad. You work two, three hours a day and hang out the rest of the day. Sounds like a good deal. If you look at the bones of some of the early people doing a doing agriculture, they, see, they end up being less healthy than hunters and gatherers. They're shorter and sicker because that surplus turned into people. And, you know, for, in the early years, well, we'll do this agriculture and this will be great. We've got all this extra food, but quickly it turned into people. But it still spread, even though the people were health, not as healthy and well fed. So why is that? We're starting to get the ideas. We're supporting specialists got military, we got leaders, so we're very organized. Crafts, we get tool makers, we get metal. So now we're getting back to the name of the book. What is the book Diamond Road? We're starting we're getting steel here. Because we got guys who can spend all their spare time building things like this. You know? Bellows, get up the iron ore, and get metal. So they're getting steel. And what do we know about if we're domesticating animals? We're agriculturalists and we're domesticating animals. What else do we get? Germs. germs. We get germs. So 
we got the guns and the germs. Well, we don't have the guns. We got the steel. Okay. So because of that, agriculture starts to spread. And it spreads out of the areas that it, it started in, like the Fertile Crescent, at a fairly quick rate. And let me get that slide back. You can see here, we got agriculture starting around 7,000 uh, BC. And it starts to spread by 6,000, by 5,000. Why is it spreading? Could be a combination of things. Could be people are changing. It could be that these guys are spreading because they have the people to do it, they have the armies to do it, and they can do it. So again, we look at Why is agriculture spreading? Why, why is it all over the place now? Back to one of the original questions. We went through these, most of them. We got more developed system, more organized uh, groups. You have more people. A lot of people, you got armies because not everyone has to farm. You got a surplus energy, you can have armies. So you can invade. Uh, specialization, steel and guns, and animals. That gives you two advantages over your hunting and gathering neighbors if you want to take their land. You got the germs. We see, we, we're going to see that later on when we look at Native Americans. And in a lot of cases, there were horses. It was the uh, panzer tank of the, old, of the old days. You get on one of them and maybe hook a chariot in the back, and uh, you know, you're not going to have you're not going to have too many hunters and gatherers standing against you. So these are some reasons why it spread. Now I want you to keep in mind that. Become an agriculturalist probably wasn't a common, you know, a, a conscious decision. You probably didn't have hunters and gatherers saying, "Well, look, if I take this and I plant it, you know, all oh, these seeds they grow." You know, hunters and gatherers know that seeds grow into new plants. That's that's easy for them. But what happens is there's a slow evolution in the hunting and gathering. You you might decide to just do a little patch one day. Just, just in case it gets tough that year. And then you might have to become a little more sedentary. Well, if you don't have a lean year, there's a chance that this is going to turn into more people. So you guys remember positive feedback? Did you do positive feedback? You're getting kind of a positive feedback kind of deal here, where you, have, you, you settle down a little, you get a little more food, you get a little more people. Oh, now I need a little more food, so I got to grow, grow some more, uh, use more agriculture. I got to be more sedentary. Oh, okay, surplus. Okay, we get more people, so it's self-catalyzing. Yeah, you can have a diminishing return because you're turning into people. Then you need to expand. You need to get more agriculture. Not yet. Hmm? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. What? No happen. <laughs> well, we've cheap. Well. Yeah, I mean it has. It's it's still going on. We, we're using greater energy inputs. We're still doing it. The population keeps going up. We just went over six billion people, and we're still trying to get greater and greater input uh, outputs. And how are we doing it today? What kind of agriculture are we doing? Monoculture. What else? Yeah, high inputs. What are we putting in? Nitrogen, phosphorus, fertilizers. So we're still doing it. So if you look around now, nobody's doing hunting and gathering. We got too many people. We can't support them with hunting and gathering. We can only support them through agriculture. 
And this is having huge environmental impacts that we'll get to later in the course.